Welcome to Liz McMullen's show. I have two of my buddies on, R.G. Emanuel and Andy Marquette, and we're talking about two unique projects. One that's been published, which is All You Can Eat, that's very studly because it got a Lammy finalist and also a Goldie finalist, which I'll have them talk about. Um, and there's Order Up, which is in the call for submission stage, so you can still get involved if you're an author out there. So welcome back to the show, you two. Yay! Woo! <laughs> I expect like those little noisemakers from like New Year's, like the. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna pull those out, but you know. <laughs> the clapping, unfortunately, sounds like something else. So, RG, why don't you give us the the high concept of the first, the first and the two? <laughs> the high concept. You know, we decided to um, do a collection of stories that involved food in some way, um, either in a romance setting or a, a sexy erotic setting. Um, and we, we got some really, really awesome stories. And the anthology is called All You Can Eat, a buffet of lesbian romance and erotica. We were very, very pleased with the stories we received. Uh, they ranged from mild, uh, romantic, cutesy kind of stories to really hot, uh, sexy erotica. And we did, uh, we did it. We set the stories up in the book in, as kind of a menu. So we started with milder stuff as appetizer. And then we got a little, we cranked up the heat, so to speak, um, for the entrees. And then we hit people with the desserts, with the really hot, sexy stuff toward the end. And yes, um, it was up for Goldie this past year, and it was up for a Lambda Literary Award, and which was really, really exciting and awesome and all kinds of things that I can't even express. One of our my listeners and editor wanted to know, did you eat while um, perusing submissions? And I'm going to add a second question. Did you find yourself craving food from the story that you were reading? <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, yes, yes, I crave food. That's right, yes. That's <laughs> Andy? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. What about you, Andy? I, I know that sometimes... So, I, I want to interject here that uh, RG and I had been talking about doing a project like this for a, a few years. We have an anthology prior to this of women pirate stories. And we had a really good time and we thought, let's do another one anthology. And uh, we decided that a food themed anthology would be a lot of fun. RG is actually a chef. Uh, she has the schooling under her belt. She has worked in, in that realm, and she is a foodie extraordinaire. So I was like, okay, you drive, and I will be the sous chef. So I am, like, the sous chef, and RG is the one who is, like, the master chef back there cooking up the recipes. As we were creating the anthology and putting it together, I there were several dishes that the authors brought up in the, <laughs> in the telling that, I was like, oh, man, I want to make that at home. And one was Karis Walsh's um, curry chicken fried steak. The other was uh, Sherry Crystal has a really great, is it a Reuben, RG? Was it, yeah. was it that yummy yeah. Reuben sandwich? Oh, my it was, God. It was a Reuben, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that one. I was like, yeah, because I'm not much of a sweets person. I don't mind them, but I, I kind of was gravitating toward the main dishes because, you know, when you do a meal, you are there's a romantic component there if you create a meal for a loved one although joe bell had a pretty nice uh, cake story kind of a cake mix story going on but it didn't make me want to run out and buy the cake mix you know what i'm saying so <laughs> <laughs> it made me want to do other things with the cake mix but well, we won't go there but what was nice was that we had such a wide range of foods because i mean yeah you had joe's story about with the that involved a box cake mix, and she turned it into this whole romantic thing, and it was that sexy thing, actually, and that was great. And then we had the Reuben sandwich, and this the setting 
for Sherry Crystal's story was an appetizing counter, which is uh, in kosher cuisine lingo, is a, a specialty deli. And I learned all, the, I mean, I I am a New Yorker, and yet this was the first time that I had ever heard about appetizing uh, counters. And it was a whole new thing that I learned, which is awesome for me as a chef to learn something new about the food world. Um uh, but then we also had uh, a story about fruit, and it became just a simple act of offering someone fruit. Who was that, Andy? Um, that, that was uh, Ashley Bartlett's yes, that's story. Right. Um, that's right. Fresh fruit, and and yes. character went on fruit gathering trips through through a city. You know, because if a fruit tree hangs over a public byway, then it's it's up for grabs. She, you know, so the character had like these routes through the city that she would go and collect certain fruits. It was really yeah. cool. It's a great story. Yeah, and the act of, of offering the, these fruits to one woman from one woman to another just became this whole sweet romantic thing, and it was really it was nice. Sweet. We had a nice range of stories. We did. We and we went from as you know, if you want to use a chili pepper scale, we went from like one chili, which is like you know, kind of sweet and romantic, to like smoking hot five chilies, <laughs> <laughs> like, like in the dessert section. In the culinary world, would be known as a Scoville scale. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just, so, chili pepper heat. <laughs> So we went like we we went by heat level, and you know that's why we started with the sweet romantic. Oh, it's so sweet! And then you get you hit your entree, you got a little more kind of meaty, sexy going on, and then you hit the desserts, and it's like you know no holds barred. Hey, it's you know, out. Andy, babe, maybe we should put chili peppers, uh, you know, on the on the stories like one chili pepper scale, one chili pepper for romantic and. Up to, five for hot. up to like um, the ghost chili for the really <laughs> crazy hot. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> Ilva does have a chili pepper scale, and um, they just uh, revamped their website, so they're they're trying to get everything loaded back up. But they do have a heat level, and it has little chili peppers, and it describes what what is included in that heat level, which is kind of cool, I think, because there are some readers that are not interested in the hot and heavy, but really like the sweet romantic, you know? So, but we, we got a really nice range of stories. Um, I actually, uh, like Rebecca Weatherspoons, I thought was really great because it was a story dealing. It's the story's called burn. And it was a story dealing with a relationship that's on the rocks. And then finally toward the end, the characters sort of like come to the realization that they really do love each other. So the one character is trying to make, a meal for her partner and she burns it. <laughs> so they sort of have to improvise. <laughs> and I just, I thought that was so great because it was dealing with real world crap and stress and how couples things can get in the way of a relationship and, and how you try to like reconcile those and, and stick together. So that was a really, a really nice addition. You know, we had just, I really liked the range that we got. We just basically told them, Go ahead, right? You know, here's your 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 theme is food. Go for it. So and let's see what happens. <laughs> so it was so successful that you decided to reprise with order up. Yep, that's basically it. And we're hoping that um, we're hoping that we get an equally good range, uh, good stories, and a nice range. You know, went from one chili pepper to five chili peppers. Five, yeah. Yeah, um, there's you have a wide range of I get heat levels and styles. Um, is there something that you find more appealing in a story, and are there some things that are pet peeves? Because I know being an editor, you guys get the the gamut. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want me to start? Yeah, you go ahead and start, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You know, romance and erotica, I, I think, are really difficult to write well. They're difficult for me, which is why I only just started really writing romance, because it's uh, how do you make an entire novel, for example, predicated on a romance? That's been difficult. A short story is a little bit better venue for me. Um, what we were looking for were different kinds of takes, you know, don't just give us the old zucchini on the nightstand. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> we 
we're, we were looking for writers who took the idea, the theme of the food, and created something that was different, like Yvonne Haidt's story. She said it in ancient Rome. Um, that was really interesting because I was like, wow, we haven't gotten anything like that. And, you know, like Rebecca Weatherspoon's story, which was about a relationship trying to, to patch itself up. And um, we had a couple of other stories in here. Sashi Green was did a, the creme brulee story, but it was sort of a kind of a cool butch femme kind of thing. So we wanted really different things rather than just, you know, you go to a restaurant, it's really hot, and you just start making out on the restaurant with the food on the table. You know, we wanted something, things that were different. Cheyenne Blue's story I thought was really well done. It's called Tomato Lady, and it's about, it's set in Australia, and it's about a woman who works on a tomato farm, and there's another woman who buys these tomatoes, and she creates these, you know, all kinds of dishes out of these tomatoes. And she, they, they kind of like like each other and so finally the buyer asks her out to dinner or to come to her house for dinner and the irony is that the woman who works on a tomato farm really doesn't like tomatoes <laughs> <laughs> that was clever i it's really you know, yeah it's a really nice take on on a food thing you know so we were looking for things that were different that you don't see in a lot of erotica stories, which are usually like, you know, get the whipped cream out and spray it and lick it off kind of thing. <laughs> it's kind of graphic here, but you know what I'm talking about. Well, and like, you know, one of the other things that um, I've realized from both of your writing is that food really does play a role. There's some, there's one, I can't remember which story, Andy, um, with wine and chocolate. Um, I think was that mine or RG's? RG's done some stories on along those lines, or I was it in the book? It, it was. I can't remember. if It was a book or a short story, but it was a neighbor who had really great oh, chocolate. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a dinner party. That's a freebie posted on my website called Dinner Party. And um, well, the, food is it's universal, right? And and different cultures inject different meanings into food. And food can be one of the most intimate things that you share with someone. You share a meal and you share conversation and it's an intimate bonding experience. It doesn't necessarily have to include sex, but it can, which is the whole premise behind these anthologies is not just the food, but what the food can lead to. And what was that movie RG um, like water for chocolate that's one, that's an example of how food kind of leads to other things. It, it's a, it's a gateway drug to intimacy, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> so RG, uh, with the, okay, I'm, I'm having a, not a full remembering of the title. Um, was it to taste? <laughs> what, what am I? Add, add spice to taste? Yes, add that spice was, yeah. to taste. Do you know what was interesting was that, um, <laughs> If it's not a weird thing to say, it's probably weird. Is that um, the, the, the that the food um, the food because there you know it was a, a cooking lessons were a part of uh, the the story and I felt like the food had a character arc. <laughs> <laughs> this, it did. <laughs> I really did. And one of the things that stuck in my head because. Um, well, I don't do a lot of cooking, but I appreciate it, and I'm, and I'm a big appreciator of scent, aroma, and flavor, and I, I had no idea what toasting different things would, would bring out um, in a spice, and I was really fascinated by that. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have uh, taught you something about food in my, in my writings. I, you know... When I decided that I was going to start incorporating food into my writing, um, I thought, oh, that's such a natural thing for me to do because in real in my real life, I, I actually am a food writer, but I write about it in realistic terms, of course. You know, I, I develop recipes, I write about different foods or restaurants or uh, how to cook this or that. Uh, so it really kind of made sense for me to incorporate it into my fiction. And as soon as I started to do that, I really, I had a lot of fun writing at Spice to Taste because I'm, I'm a writer. I've always been a writer. So I enjoy that aspect of it in and of itself. But then when I started to write about the food part of it, um, I loved it. 
I love writing about food because that's my other passion. Writing is a passion. Food is a passion for me. And damn, I just figured out a way to combine the two, you know, and it just was really great. You know, there, I keep doing it. there are some authors that seem to do it more than others. There's a panel. Um, I think it was, it wasn't this year. I think it was in Portland and it was on authors who do use food a lot in their stories. And it was Karen Callmaker, Georgia Beers, Mary Griggs. Um, yeah. Me. What? Me. You, <laughs> you, <laughs> how could I forget you? Damn it. See, you can't, I can't trust my memory. It's been too long. <laughs> I think, I think I clean my cash too much and I don't have memory. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it I my, my cash is cleared out <laughs> <laughs> but actually now that you mention it I actually know where you were sta- where you were sitting on the panel so I know <laughs> and um <laughs> Yeah, but it was. But what? What the reason why I bring it up is I. I have this series that I do for GCLS, and it's called um, uh, GCLS presents the author salon. And I ask, uh, I ask them, you know, each author, is there a sense that's more prominent um, as a person in your life, and is it that the same sense that is predominant in your writing? And I feel like there are some. There are some authors, in particular, like. Uh, Georgia Beers and Karen Callmaker, food is really often a character in their stories. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. Which is groovy. Yeah. Food is awesome. Um, yeah, I, in fact, I mean, uh, um, uh, Georgia Beers' latest book is, uh, what, what is it called? Um, oh, my God, I'm having a scene. It's, it's a spice book. It has spice in the title. I haven't read it yet, unfortunately. Right. And then also olive oil. Oil and bread. bread. Yeah. And, and, and starting from scratch with the cover has, you know, like the, the cake mix in the dough. That was an awesome story. I mean, right? like her, when she's the one character, uh, when she's nervous or freaked out, she bakes <laughs> and bakes right, right. and bakes and bakes. I, it, I remembered it. A little bit of spice. <laughs> right. It had spice yeah. in the title. Yeah. That's right. It's driving me crazy. Okay. But I, I enjoyed that because um, it was a vehicle to learn more about that particular character. Like she was always bringing all the things that she overcooked. Um, not overcooked as in burned, but, you know, she <laughs> made right, more than right. she could possibly eat. And, and everybody loves and hates her at work for the same reason. And right. as a reader, um, have you found certain books that, have resonated with you because of the way that they uh, utilize um, food as a catalyst for behavior? Well, that's the question. Uh... <laughs> I know it's so awkwardly asked too. I was like, trying to, I was trying to find the words. I'm like, that is just so in- inelegant. Uh... <laughs> a lot of cozy mysteries actually that incorporate food and food into the titles. Like uh, I think, uh, uh, da, 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 da. Ellen Hart writes one, didn't the, well, her main character own a restaurant? Jane Lawless? Oh. I, I'm pretty sure. I've read a few of them. I haven't read all of them yet. But there's a lot of cozy mysteries that incorporate food. And, you know, people who are either like bakers or they're restaurateurs or, you know, one of the two. Well, so entirely, it's not a common thing. Yeah, they're entire oh, series that are based on mm-hmm. food themes. They're not necessarily... Uh, lesbian fiction but they're definitely out there quite a few actually entire series just based on that food theme the the other thing that just popped in my head um is from one of your sci-fis andy where once they they finished drinking a beverage the the um was it i know with the food or whatever the the holders would kind of dissolve instead of creating tons and tons of garbage Depends. Some of the holdings, if you're out, if you're on an earthbound holding, then they do tend to use actual glassware. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, in restaurants, no, and eateries, the 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 vessels dissolve, which I thought was kind of a cool idea. And now I think somebody should invent that. Get on that, Liz. Yeah, yeah, because that that that's what I'm going to put on my platter of new things to learn, amongst the other things that I've <laughs> piled up on lately. 
I've described to random people what I've been up to, and you're like, wow, you're so busy. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm boring people. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So let's see. The two of you are incredibly busy. You make me very tired whenever I ask what you're up to. I know, right? I, I... I think you, I mean, Andy, you, you wrote me, you wrote me this little summary of what your life was like. And I was just like, I am exhausted. <laughs> it, it goes in, in waves. I, I told RG to use another food metaphor with me, it's feast or famine. Mm-hmm. Like I either am completely slammed and my eyeballs are vibrating in my head or I have like a week or two of downtime. I'm kind of in some downtime right now Mm -hmm. because I slammed out two novels this year. And so right now I'm sort of kind of just coasting a little bit as I work on some other projects that have popped up. What novels Um, would those be? I'm sorry. What novels would those be? Uh, I I released in October. Well, Ilva publishing released uh, the secret of sleepy hollow, which is a takeoff on the legend of sleepy hollow. And in about a week, Available through Ilva only at first is my holiday novel, The Bureau of Holiday Affairs. It's a takeoff on uh, Dickens's The Christmas Carol. Um, how do you how do you find time to do the projects? Like you you edit anthologies, um, you write stories, you write novels. How do you carve out time in such a busy schedule? Like I find the day flying past me, and it's not even close to what your days look like at times. Yeah. You just do it, right, RG? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you kind of have to just, like, close your eyes and just (laughs) try to fly through it because if you think too much about it, it becomes very overwhelming. There are are times when I feel so overwhelmed that I just sit down on my couch and think about all the things I need to do, and I don't know what to do first. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly become very overwhelmed, and I have to remove myself from that state of mind and just say, okay, just, just pick something to do. Uh, what's, what's, you know, what needs to get done first? Um, and just do it. And I just have to push through, you know, because otherwise, uh, otherwise I'll get nothing done. Quite mm-hmm. frankly. <laughs> that's true. And I'm just going to like promote, an Ilva book that's coming out this month too. It's uh, editor Sandra Girth's uh, time management for authors tips. <laughs> so, you know, so if that's something you authors need, you know, there it is. And, and both RG and I work day jobs in addition to our writing lives. Mm-hmm. So we, we have to be very, very concise with our time and what we use it for. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a matter of, literally making a schedule and sticking to it as best you can, but allowing yourself a little wiggle room when, when you're just burned out and you can't do it. I I do that. I figure that in too. And that is an issue too. Burnout is a serious, uh, uh, consideration because it happens, you know, Uh, you know, I got burnt on doing these shows and I, I pretty much took a year off from it. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. You, You got to. Yeah, absolutely. It happens. You know, it just is too becomes too much sometimes, and you can't even think straight. Um, well, not that we all, any of us think straight. <laughs> you, you straight ga- you, gaily forward, gaily right? forward, gaily forward, and uh, as a complete really no transition um i did want to ask one more question uh from our listening audience and it's actually something that you know i guess could be kind of wormsy um suzanne m harding asked what's the dividing line between erotica and pornography well she said porn but um or is it a sliding mark that depends on the eyes of the reader i think it really is uh in the eyes of the beholder because some people consider any amount of sex at all in a story to be pornographic. Um, and some consider anything less than the hardcore S and M to be, you know, mild erotica. It, it really depends on, uh, individual readers. Uh, it, It is a difficult question to answer, and it's one that's been debated for a long time by many, many people, and it has a history even in the feminist movement, and what is porn, and take back porn, and, you know, the questions of uh, why shouldn't women, you know, create pornography 
but are women being, um, you know, um, exploited. Uh, exploited? Thank you. So, I mean, it's a huge issue. It's a huge question. And I don't really think there's an answer to that. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll just raise this issue. <clears throat> I think, um, in, in our current mainstream media and pop culture and, and the, in our current culture that porn depends on who, on the gaze, on who the sex act is created for. And in, in a lot of like porn sites and the like, I think that is created specifically for a male gaze. Mm. Whereas the erotica, erotica tends to be engage the reader more in the lives and the loves of the characters. I personally think it's up to the reader, how, what, whatever they want to like look at, you know, within as long as it involves consenting adults, people, and no animals and old people and children were harmed in the making of this porn, it's fine with me. Um, but there's a story coming out of Tennessee in which a, a woman completely flipped out about a, a lesson in a school book, in a, I guess it was a high school text about cervical cancer, and she actually said that cervix is pornographic. So it depends, like RG was saying, on the context of the person viewing it or reading it and what their whole construct around sex and sexuality is. I personally like to write sex between characters who are consenting and having a really great time with each other. I I think there's something beautiful about that. I have like one final question before we finish our time together, um, and it's a, it's a question for authors. Um, why why is it good to take part in anthologies in addition to writing novels? Like, what what is the utility that writing short fiction and being a part of an anthology can do for your career as a writer? RG, you want to do that? Uh, sure. I. It is a great way of getting exposure, introducing yourself to people. Uh, people may not necessarily want to invest in a whole book from you, but maybe a short story, you know, isn't that big of an investment. They read your story and they think, huh, this is really good. I want more from this writer. And it, um, it also writing a longer piece is, is time consuming and uh, uh, labor intensive, and so by by creating these little snippets, these little stories, it puts you out there and gets people to get to know you. Let it allows people to get to know you, mm-hmm. and so when you do create these longer pieces, you've you've built an audience for yourself. Here's here's my metaphor: you go to a bar and you don't want a whole glass of beer, but the bartender gives you a taste. Mm-hmm. And, and like a, a flight of beer tastes when you have, you know, six to eight little shots there of beer, mm-hmm. that's an anthology to me. Oh, it's that's like, very clever, Andy. You get to like try all kinds of different beers, i.e. authors, and the ones that you really like, you go for the pint. I'm mm-hmm. just saying it. You would use beer as an <laughs> No, and, and I've, you know, I, I've, I've enjoyed that with beer, with um, cocktails and tequila drinks. And right, you can do it. You can order samples of uh, whiskey when you go to a tasting, that kind of thing. But that's what it is. And I absolutely encourage authors to write short stories for anthology inclusion because sometimes the anthologies win awards and your story is in there. That's awesome. That's right. That's the point. Yeah. True. And we want you guys to submit stories to us. Come on, folks. Write some food stuff. Come on. Like, we'll show we'll us your chocolate. You want to play with us. <laughs> come, into our, come into our kitchen. That's come right. On come on. Come on. in an apron. Here's come an apron. <laughs> Um, thank you two so much um, for coming to talk about uh, these wonderful projects and, you know, little nuggets of wisdom for both writers and readers. Um, I appreciate you both. Thanks, Liz. I really appreciate it. As always.